thanks for all you are to each one of us. Speak to us today in our hearts and in our minds. Transform us, change us and renew us. To your name be glory. Amen. Amen. So as I say, it's wonderful to see so many of you here. And I've been excited about this conference since we first conceived it, which was earlier this year. The genesis of the conference was that I was talking to a bishop and he said, oh, well, we can't move on marriage because the theology hasn't been done. And I kind of reflected on it a bit. I thought, is that right? Has the theology really not been done? And I thought of all the people who've done work on this over the past 20 or 30 years. And I thought, right, well, let's, um, let's try and get as much of the theology on same-sex marriage into one place and have a conference and just see what's around. We're not prejudging the issue. The question that we're asking this conference is, is it possible to have a theology of marriage which includes same-sex marriage, and if so, what might that theology look like? And so I'm hoping that by the end of the day we have a corpus of thought which will send you away encouraged and inspired, but will also enable us to demonstrate to the wider church that this work is around, that the idea of same-sex marriage is not something which has just emerged recently out of nowhere, and that if people think that there is justifiable theology, that the grounding for that is available and can be used. This conference has been put together by the LGBT Anglican Coalition, which is a coalition of six, seven groups. LGCM, Changing Attitude, Civils, Accepting Evangelicals, Inclusive Church, the General Synod of the Centrality Group, and the Evangelical Fellowship of Lesbian and Gay Christians. But it gives me great delight to be able to introduce Charlotte Methuen, who has come all the way from Glasgow, part of the United Kingdom, hurrah. <laughs> <laughs> so she would have had to bring her passport. Charlotte is a church historian and an Anglican priest. She's a senior lecturer in the Theology and Religious Studies Department at the University of Glasgow. Her specialism is the 16th century and marriage and women in the church. And her recent books are Luther and Calvin, Religious Revolutionaries, and Science and Theology in the Reformation. So we're delighted that you could be here, from Charlotte. Thank you very much indeed for coming. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, I'm not quite sure I'm a specialist in the history of marriage, um, but I have, throughout my theological career, been really interested in the way in which gender, sexuality are dealt with in Christian history and really what I'm going to do with you today in this paper is to think with you some about some of the ways in which um, marriage has been dealt with in Christian history and tradition. I'm going to begin by looking at the New Testament, well I'm going to, going to begin by looking at the Old Testament actually um, and then move on to looking at the New Testament and then we're going to have a brief counter through Christian history. You realise for 45 minutes that's about a century. Um, well, let's not work it out. Um, but I hope you'll get some highlights. And what I'm hoping you'll see is that although we may talk about Christian marriage as we may think we know what we mean by it, what I'm hoping you'll think by the end of this paper is that actually we're not at all sure what we mean by Christian marriage, and maybe that's quite a good place to start. Marriage has been much in the news recently, and the British press seems to have a prurial interest in marriage. And there was a, a, a thing circulated on Facebook a while about counting up how many times one of the film stars have been married, sometime, one time, I think only just for one week, and saying, you know, what is it about heterosexual marriage that it's so wonderful? It's particularly been in, in the press, of course, though, because we have been moving in the last year to the introduction of same sex marriage. On a legal status, and or as a legal status, as a legal possibility, and the churches, of course, have been struggling with that. I'm not going to particularly talk about that process, but I do think it has brought to the fore some some of the questions that many people in churches have been trying to avoid doing theology about for a lot of the last 20, 25 years. Um, and that's part of what I am going to talk about in this paper. Marriage and sexuality, it seems to me, are emotive topics because they are fundamental to who we are. 
And that is as true for Christians as it is for anybody else. And that means that what we bring to this debate is rooted not only in what we think and we believe intellectually, but also in our lived experience. How each of us experiences our relationships with other people. If we're married, how we experience and live out our own marriage. If we're not married, how we experience other people's marriages or how we experienced our parents' marriage, if they were married, all of those things shape how we come to this debate. I think there's a big gap, for instance, between somebody like me who grew up in the 60s and was born in the 60s with parents who were quite into the swinging 60s side of things and somebody whose parents, in, in, even in my own generation, who grew up with a family which was absolutely not into that kind of thing. You have a totally different attitude about what you think is right, what you think is wrong, simply because you grew up with different expectations with your own, within your own family. All of that shapes how we read scripture, how we read history, and also shapes, I think, how we understand the authority of the church and its remit, and what it, we allow it to tell us about um, how we ought to be living our lives. And I think one of the things we're experiencing at the moment, and Linda Woodhead's surveys have shown us this, is a radical split between what people say about the authority of the church and how they actually live the authority of the church. But that's perhaps a, a discussion for another time. But I think it fits into thinking about questions about sexuality. And the Roman Catholic Church is a really great example here. It still bans contraception. I don't know personally, the Roman Catholics I know always rep contraception. That may be a, a small sample. How do, how do we allow the church to tell us what we should or shouldn't think? And how does the church respond to what we say we think? I think that's part of the tension that we're living out at the moment. All this is trying to get to a beginning of this paper which says that we are living in complex times in how we think about authority over our own lives. And that means it's really difficult for us, I think, increasingly to actually hold together what we think we are as a church in terms of what Christian teaching is and what it thinks it's trying to do. But I also think that recognising that all of us as Christ's disciples are trying to live out what we understand to be God's calling to us is not a bad place to start in this debate and might actually take some of the heat out of the problems. We care about these questions because we believe that God cares. It's clear to us all, I think, that in this debate, as so often, fundamental belief lead, has led and leads Christians in very different directions. And sometimes people say the same thing and mean very different things. And we need to be a bit more alert to that, I think, than we sometimes have been. Some Christians, therefore, are adamant that the Christian ideal of marriage is and can only be between one man and one woman, and that it provides the proper context in which children are conceived and raised, whilst others understand deep, committed relationships to be of themselves God-given and marriage-like, regardless of whether they're between one man and one woman, two women, two men, or possibly other constellations. But within those general categories, people have very varied opinions. People may argue that marriage is properly between one man and one woman, and hold that Christian marriage is a fund fundamentally a relationship between two people who are equal in the sight of God. Or they may argue that marriage is properly between one man and one woman and hold that the proper understanding of Christian marriage is that the woman, whilst equally beloved to God, is in the created order and is subordinate to the man. And even within that position, there are different views. Does subordination mean obedience or does it mean submission? I have a colleague who is a university chaplain who has encountered young women who want to change the words of the marriage vows which in the Church of England is actually illegal, to allow them to promise to submit to their husband rather than to obey him. So when people say 
we think marriage is between one man, one man one man and one woman. I want to push back and say, well, what do you mean by that? What do you mean by that kind of relationship? Because actually it's a much smaller step from saying this is a, a relationship of equals to, from there to, I think, supporting same, the idea of same-sex marriage as a Christian institution than it is from a, a, a relationship of unequals. And one of the things I'm going to argue in this paper is that there's been a major shift over the last hundred years from seeing marriage fundamentally as a hierarchical institution to seeing marriage fundamentally as an, as an, equality, an institution of equality or a relationship of equality. So what I want to say right from the beginning is that um, even if people, we agree, which I'm not, most of us here wouldn't, I suspect, that it's marriages between one man and one woman, people hold very different views about what kind of relationship that is. And I think one of the things that we could usefully do in the church is to probe a bit more when people say, this is what it should be. Well, what do you actually mean by that? What kind of relationship are you looking 